worship. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He shows our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom we love. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord above the sounding of trumpets. Shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcome. <laughs> Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In humility and awe, let us confess our sin before the throne of our heavenly Father, trusting in his faithfulness and seeking his mercy and grace. Together we say, most holy and merciful Father, we confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slothful and good, and all our shortcomings and offenses. Let alone know how often we have sinned, and wandering through your ways, and wasting your gifts, and forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, we are ashamed and sorry for all wherein we have displeased you. Teach us to keep our errors, cleanse us from our secret faults, and forgive our sins for the sake of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. 
Let's take a moment for silent personal confession. Let us rise for the assurance of pardon. It is not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake.
So much toys and YouTube revelations. Lovely, yes, that could be that could be an ordeal and it could be such a rejoicing when it's done. Yes. And then oh, yes, here we go. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have made us your people, you have chosen us. We are elect in Jesus Christ. And you invite us to bring to us, to bring to you our needs, our desires, our petitions, our supplications, our intercessions. We thank you that because Jesus is our faithful representative and head. That even now, he sits at your right hand, O Father, interceding for us. And that when we pray in his name, you hear us. We thank you that no request is too big or too small to come before you. And that we acknowledge in faith that you will dispose all things for our good and for your glory. First of all, O oh Lord, we do give you thanks that you are the maker and king of all creation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all things were made through you. We give you thanks <coughs> that when we went astray, you did not give up on us, but sent your only begotten Son to take out our flesh and to win the victory over sin and death on our behalf, that we might, not, might be reconciled to you and more than reconciled, made your children, made your representatives here on earth. Speak you speaking your truth through us. Lord, we give you thanks for sending your Holy Spirit at Pentecost to fill your disciples, to form your church, to make us into your one, one body of Jesus Christ, one throughout the earth, and manifest invisible congregations like this one. We ask, the Lord, that you will bless this congregation, bless her members, bless her efforts, bless her ministries. We thank you for a successful board meeting recently. We thank you for the hanging of the greens, which will be happening after this service. We ask that you will bless this, this congregation as they go into the season of Advent and Christmas tide, that the life of Jesus Christ born so humbly, born to be king, will shine from this place and shine from each member's life, not only in the time of Advent and Christmas, but throughout the earth, throughout the year, and not just here, but everywhere that your message goes. Lord, we give you thanks for the work of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, who causes us to do wonderful things, that even where two or three are gathered together, you and Christ are in the midst of them by the power of your Spirit. So we ask you send, that you will send your Spirit upon this people, that they may do mighty things in your name. And we pray for all your faithful churches, we pray for, especially for the Presbytery of Washington. We pray for churches throughout the world, especially in places where one can be persecuted for preaching the whole gospel of Christ. Sadly, we need to include in that the churches in Canada where one can be arrested, pastors can be arrested for preaching the whole counsel, the whole law of God. 
We pray for our brothers and sisters in Muslim countries, in communist countries, in Hindu countries, where people, your people, are persecuted and arrested and beaten and scorned and have their livelihoods taken away because they confess the name of Jesus. Help us to stand with them, to stand strong with them, that they and we together will remain faithful. Help us to stand strong so that persecution should come to us, that we are keeping our eyes and our faith and our loyalty on Christ our King, and to stand in call of assurance and love before the rulers of this earth, praying that they too will be converted to know that Jesus is the true and only Lord. Lord God, we pray for the nations of this world, especially we pray for the nation of Ukraine, and we pray, yes, we pray for the nation of Russia. Lord God, we ask that peace and good sense will prevail there, that you will work upon the heart of Vladimir Putin, who claims to be one of yours in the Russian Orthodox Church, that he will see that there is no interest for Russia to do what they are doing, that they will withdraw. We ask that the people of Ukraine will continue, will trust in you, continue to trust in you. We pray for your missionaries who are serving there, that they may minister to the refugees and to be a good example of your courage and strength. Lord God, we ask that everywhere there is conflict and sorrow in the world, that even so the light of the gospel will shine and the trouble will cause people to <coughs> flee to you for comfort, for hope safety. Even if the safety of this of our bodies is compromised, that we can know that the safety of our souls is always secure in you. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, for Joseph, our president, for Kamala, our vice president, for Charles, the majority leader of the Senate, for Nancy, the Speaker of the House. We pray for the incoming Congress and Senate. We pray for all who are in river in leadership over us, for Thomas, our governor, and all the officials of our townships and boroughs, that they may do what is right and just and honorable, that they may acknowledge that all their authority <coughs> comes from you. We thank you for making us a sovereign people here in these United States of America. And may we too remember that we have our responsibility, that any authority we have to elect our rulers also comes from you, and that we will be called to give an account of how we have exercised that authority. We thank you, O oh Lord, for all your good gifts of this world, we thank you for harvest. We thank you for the Thanksgiving feast that will come this Thursday. May we be truly thankful for all you have given us and not take anything for granted. We ask that you will supply and help and sustain our, our neighbors and brothers and sisters in the regions of Buffalo and Erie and upstate New York that have been so hard hit by the snowfall. Lord, truly, your deeds in nature are awesome and can be terrifying. Remind us always that you are in charge and that you will bring us safely through all such challenges and that though the weather may be chaotic, though the earth may shake, you are never good, that you are good and just and holy, 
and in you there is continual refuge for your people. We thank you, O oh Lord, for all your goodness in our ordinary everyday activities. We pray for this, your blessing upon the soccer tournament, which is being played, especially for Sam. We thank you and ask that all the players may play well with good sportsmanship, that they may play hard and fairly, and win, win or lose, that they may give glory to your name. We give you thanks for the kitchen renovations, which are being completed by one of the families here, that the backsplash is being completed, and we thank you that that will be a matter of rejoicing that every time that family stands at that sink, stands in that kitchen, they may say, this project was a gift for God. He enabled us to have this, and it was a blessing for him. May his name be praised. We ask that You will help us to remember those who do not have the same amount of gifts and blessings that we have, that we will be blessed in blessing them with our material possessions, with our attention, with our time, with our prayers, with our thoughts. We ask that you will come alongside those who are suffering from any health issues, especially for the friend that has been mentioned in the prayer concerns. We ask that you will be alongside Antonio in the hospital and for the whole Popolo family. We ask that in all these things we remember that we are your hands and feet. We are your good word of comfort. We are your listening ear here on earth. May we discharge our ministry in joy and understanding and love. We ask that you will be with our members and loved ones who are, who, are in the ministry, who are in the military, that they may discharge their duties well and truly and honorably, especially those who are serving overseas. And I ask you, oh Lord, to be with my friend Brenda as she rests from the latest course of chemotherapy and embarks on another in another week. And we ask your blessing upon all those who are suffering from any problems, any illnesses of mind or body or spirit, difficulties with financial issues or unemployment or family issues. Lord, you are stronger than all of those. May all our afflictions cause us to run to you, to know you, seek to know you better, to seek your help, first of all. We give you thanks, O Lord, that Jesus Christ indeed is King, and that one day we will worship him around his throne, the Lamb who was slain, serving him and praising him always with the communion of all your saints, and looking forward to that time, O Lord. We ask that you will help us not only to say, but also to live the prayer your Son, our Savior, taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
us pray. Almighty God, as your word is read and as I preach it, send your Holy Spirit upon us. That these will not, what we read will not just be mere symbols on a page, mere sounds in our ears, but what they are, your word, your revelation, inspired and holy for us, given for us, to give us life and hope and peace and salvation. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Father, you may follow along in your bulletin. I will be reading the text out of the New International Version. Our Old Testament reading is Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. And our New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 2. This is the conclusion of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost after the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the church. We begin with verse 22. By the Holy Spirit, Peter's speaking. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to my miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, and will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see the pain. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not descend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
Let's go ahead to the 30 next two verses. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other his apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. May the Lord bless our hearts and minds these readings from His Holy Word. Amen. Testament reads, 
reading Psalm 2, the psalmist prophet inquires, Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? From time immemorial, <coughs> kings and peoples have not wanted to acknowledge the God of Israel. The people of Israel and Judah so often did not want to properly acknowledge their own God. And they feel that if they could just kind of get together to agree to do things against the will of God, they can make it so. They can bend reality to say good is evil and evil is good. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and his anointed one. Why? Because the Lord and his anointed one are a threat. A threat against their, their, their sovereignty, their own will, their, what, their desire to do what they want. But who is this anointed one? On the purely earthly level, that would have been the king of Israel. David or Solomon or some other king of David's line as we read in the book of Acts, as faithfully ruling in submission to the law of the Lord. But as we go on, we'll see that this psalm looks beyond any mere mortal rumor and points beyond, beyond that king sitting in physical Zion to the Messiah king who would come from David's line. In other words, we can confidently state that the anointed one, the one who has had oil poured on his head. The Messiah, which means anointed one in Hebrew. The Christ, which is anointed one in Greek. Spoken in, in verse 2, is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then and now, the rulers of the, of the nations and the peoples under them conspire against Christ and his sovereign rule. Let us break their chains, they say in verse 3, and throw off their fetters. Why? Because to any unconverted nation, and I'm talking including right now the United States of America, the righteousness of God is a chain and a fetter and a shackle. Huh, why shouldn't we human beings do whatever we want? Why shouldn't each individual, each individual defy for him or herself? what's right and wrong. Why should the state set itself up as the inventor and giver of new rights, and by the way, the taker away of existing rights, that God Almighty never gave, nor did it ever enter his mind to give them? And to this end, to this end, people willfully ignore what tr Scripture truly says, to this end, we make an idol of our own comfort. To this, to this end, for me, the church of God must be fed. Preachers must be told what they can and cannot preach. Missionaries must be forbidden to dispense the medicine of the gospel and be restricted to soothing people's bodies alone. And woe to any individual Christian who stands up for the will of the Lord on the job or in social media. These days, you can risk real hardship if you don't keep your mouth shut and your head down. In the face of this defiance, what does the Lord and King of creation do? He laughs. Decisively, derisively, and satirically, he laughs. It's not a laugh you want directed at you. And when he has laughed, as it says in verse 5, he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. All these ungodly attitudes and positions taken up by the world's elected and unelected leaders make God angry, justifiably angry. The whole world is in rebellion against him, the rightful king, and if he does not punish that rebellion and set things right, the universe will, will descend 
into misery, chaos, and destruction. And so, over against the kings and rulers of this world, over against the people who so foolishly follow them, the one and throne in heaven elects the king of his choice. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill, the Lord says in verse 6. Again, for a time, that can refer to the Davidic king anointed to reign for a time in Jerusalem. But the best of these men were only placeholders until the ultimate anointed Lord, King Jesus, would come and sit down at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly Zion. We see that Jesus is worthy to take the throne by his perfect life and ministry, by his humble obedience and dying on the cross, by his glory is bursting forth from the tomb on the day of resurrection, by his ascension into heaven, by his sending of the Holy Spirit, and one day we will see his worthiness to reign when he comes to judge the living and the dead. We do not yet see the kings of this earth terrified by the wrath of God. They think they can go on as they are. And for the time being, the Lord allows it. For the time being, he lets them think they're in charge. But God's election results have come in. And the Lord Christ himself declares in verse 7, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Or as it can be translated, today I have begotten you. This day he speaks of is from of old, from eternity past, from eternal ages. He always, always was the Son of God. But Christ the Lord, the man Jesus, is proclaimed in the perfection of his ministry to be Christ the King. He receives the reward of his fruitful labor. And God says to him, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And by the way, if you remember those lines or something like the hand of the Messiah, good, this is where they come from. Christ the King is no symbolic ruler. He is an absolute monarch, and he will put up with no rebellion and no misuse of his name, no misuse of his word, when he returns to judge the earth. Now, as Christians, we might be tempted to look on Jesus' kingship like we here in South Southwestern Pennsylvania feel looking at the images of all that snow that fell this last couple of days up in Erie and Buffalo. We might say, wow, I'd hate to be them. But they yeah, it doesn't really affect us. But Christ's kingship does affect us. The people gathered in Jerusalem listening to the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost would have considered themselves to be good, law-abiding Jews. After all, hadn't they taken to make some of the journeys of, you know, hundreds of miles to get to Jerusalem for the feast, as the law of Moses commanded? But as Peter preached to them, they understood that each of them was in rebellion against God's elected king. In his or her own way, each of them had crucified the Lord of glory. Each of them needed to repent. Now, Jesus, our King, is not demanding that we get saved all over again. His blood shed on the cross cleanses us once and for all. But he does call us to trust him for who he is, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He calls us to repent of compromising with evil, to re repent of our willful ignorance of what Scripture truly says, to repent of making idols of our own comfort and safety. He calls us to repent on Him 
for our safety, provision, and comfort. Not on the kings of this earth, not on our elected officials. Yes, if they do what is righteous and good, let us follow them. May God protect and prosper and bless them, but we must never give them the allegiance that is due to God alone. For as the psalmist prophet writes, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. They and we and all people should be in trembling awe of the power of Jesus' name. And at the same time, all rulers and nations are commanded to rejoice in the power of that name. For when we come to him in repentance and faith, he exercises his power on our behalf to protect and save. Kiss the son. Give him a kiss of allegiance. Lest he be angry and he be destroyed in your way. This term, in your way, reminds me of Proverbs 14, 12, where it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Christ the King does not want us or our rulers to keep walking in the way that leads to destruction and death. He does not want us to run into his wrath that can flare up in a moment. Rather, he calls unbelievers to pledge their allegiance to, them, to him. He calls us as believers to rededicate ourselves and all we are and all we have to his service. Blessed, says the psalmist, are those who take refuge in him. It's true. The elections have consequences. We shall soon see what the ultimate consequences of our recent midterm election is, elections are. But for eternity, we can know and rejoice in the results of God the Father's choice of his Son, Jesus Christ, to be both Lord and Christ. We can rejoice that he has chosen us in him to be his possession, eternally blessed in, in Jesus. May all glory be to his name, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of not made, one of the being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us sin and for our salvation.
king. You have the privilege of knowing and living in his kingdom even now, to, to know that you are living in his kingdom. Go therefore, in humility, in thanksgiving, in love, to serve him, to know his blessing. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always.